Hey everyone, good morning. Hope y'all are having a beautiful day and hopefully enjoying some nice spring weather, finally. I spent all day yesterday working out on my patio and I asked you all what you wanted to see here on this channel. And the first response was a Q&A, which is perfect because I have a ton of questions saved up from the YouTube community tab and from Instagram. So we're gonna get into that today. But before we get into the questions, just a quick request for you all. I am entering a season where I kind of I'm starting to have a little bit more time. My life's getting a little less busy and I really want to focus in here on YouTube once again. So please let me know what types of videos you wanna see more of, if there's anything new that you'd like me to try. I really take your feedback very seriously. So please comment below if there's um, any platforms you want me to explore, just anything at all that comes to mind, please let me know. I would love your feedback. But for today, let's go ahead and get started with this Q&A. So these ones come from the YouTube community tab. The first question is from Kyle and Jess. One question that keeps coming around is the world of brand deals. When it comes to creating brand connections, who's doing the majority of the reaching out? Are you reaching out to brands to make connections or are they mostly approaching you? And if you are reaching out to brands, what are some of your best practices and approaches that you take when reaching out? These days for me personally, most of my brand deals come inbound, meaning that they're just reaching out to me. And I think there's a few things that you can do to make yourself more approachable. Obviously you can create brand friendly content. Also just having an easy way for people to contact you. So having your email address listed in your Instagram, you know, uh, profile in your YouTube description box, things like that. And, you know, just building that community. I think nowadays brands definitely look at engagement rate more than subscriber count. So don't let a small subscriber count or follower count scare you. Just make sure that your engagement is high and that you're, you know, obviously trying to get more views and stuff like that. I have worked with a couple of different sort of partnership managers over the years who have done some outbound work for me, but I would still say that like 70% of the brand deals that I get come inbound and then they just kind of do the negotiation, but they do do some outreach for me. So I can't really speak to like their methods that all that much, but I will say that I did an interview with a friend of mine, Nina Zeta. She has a company called Sidewalker Daily and that is all that she teaches. So I'll link the interview up here. Okay, this question comes from Steven. Steven's an architect and um, does some really cool stuff. Love following him. He says, not sure if this ever happens to you, but sometimes I have multiple projects lined up in the same project phase. And I can go from completely swamped to completely open for work in a matter of days. How do you rebound from that? Do you intentionally try to stagger different accounts with your onboarding phases versus implementing your services slash deliverable? Um, Yes, absolutely. I know that feeling. And I think that is exactly the answer is you have to stagger projects, or at least I do. I can't onboard more than two clients at once. That is just very hectic. Um, and again, Steven's in a different industry, obviously, than I am. So I don't know exactly what your work is like, but I would assume in business in general, that onboarding phase is the most time consuming, the most stressful, the most like confusing, um, where the client actually needs the most kind of handholding and personalized attention. So it's really hard for me to do that more than once or twice at a time. So I think it just comes down to communication when you're on those discovery calls, those, you know, initial meetings, even on your form, your contact form or your website, maybe, you know, putting when you are available to start taking on new clients. So like for me right now, it's April, I wouldn't be able to onboard a new client until May. So maybe I could put that on my website saying now booking for May, 2023. I see a lot of people do that, but it is a lot of just like using my calendar, using my task management software. I use Asana to kind of move clients through that sort of onboarding phase and making sure that I know exactly where they're at. And yeah, that's all you can do is be honest. Of course, I'm not going to lie that I have overdone it and I have said yes when I should have said no. Sometimes I will do that for a rush fee. If there is somebody who just absolutely needs to get started on something, they have a really critical deadline, I can do it at an additional cost or obviously just gauging like how valuable it is to me. You know, um, if there's something I really want to do or somebody I really want to work with, I'll make it work. But in most cases, I'm trying to definitely stagger. Random Stuff, that's the YouTube channel, asked, what would you recommend? Work for an agency for some time before starting a freelance marketing business or go through books, courses, and experience and learn the art? I don't know if that comment got 
cut off. I have it pasted into my notes, so um, <laughs> I don't know if that got cut off, but I, I would never prescribe a particular path for anybody. I think we all have our own journeys for a reason. And I mean, I've done a video years ago about like every job I've ever had and Seriously, all of those jobs I take with me today and I use some aspect of them from working in retail, from working in restaurants, from working at nonprofits to working in politics. You know, I take all of those experiences and use them today. So my answer is I think there's really no such thing as bad experience. I got experience at a virtual agency and that really introduced me to the world of social media. I was a social media copywriter for them. So I was at that point just kind of writing tweets. I was also writing blogs, things like that. And yeah, it definitely helped me to understand the structure of how a marketing team works, how to work with clients, what types of questions you're gonna get from clients without being all the way in it myself, you know, and having to be fully responsible for it myself. And then of course, after the agency, I worked in-house for a couple of brands. So I am happy with that experience, but I also know plenty of people who just dove right in and started their own businesses and love it. So I think, you have to kind of know yourself. Um, I do think that experience is extremely valuable. So to your point, if you're not gonna work at an agency or for a brand, you definitely need to be getting that experience somehow and investing in your education, books, courses, all that stuff is super valuable. And um, I, you know, everyone has their own journey. Dave Hartman asked, how do you schedule your day slash week? So I'm a big calendar blocker. So I start by blocking off my days. So I have particular days that I do particular things. Uh, today's Tuesday. Tuesdays, I usually either film content or edit content. It's like a content day for me. Mondays are usually admin days. So I'm usually not taking any meetings and I'm just doing, you know, bookkeeping type stuff, paying invoices, sending invoices, uh, you know, just that kind of stuff. So it, it really depends. And then from there, I break up my day into time blocks as well. So not so much on like my admin days. Those are kind of more of like my free flowing days because it really varies so much on what actually needs to get done. But on content creation day, for example, I have a two hour time block for shooting this content right now. That includes my get ready time, my setup time, and my sitting down to shoot time. Then after this, I'm gonna go into a co-working session where I actually start editing the video. And then, you know, I have blocks for other things throughout the day. So that just works well for me because it, it time boxes me. You know, if I give myself eight hours to film a video, I will take eight hours to film a video. It's Ellie J said, it seems algorithms and new features and trends are always changing across the multiple social media apps. How do you know when these changes happen? So this is my not, I, I don't know, this is not good advice. I know people hate it when I say this, but I don't pay attention to the algorithm that much. Like obviously I do, I, I pay attention. I know when something wild changes or happens, but I'm not like married to the algorithm. I'm not, a, I'm not obsessed with the algorithm. I'm not sitting here thinking every five minutes, like what, what's gonna be good for the algorithm. At the end of the day, I focus on telling good stories, connecting with my audience, and like the rest will do its job, you know? With that said, I think it's just important to pay attention to how your content is performing, you know, just day by day, week by week. So I know, I, I know that um, Adam Masseri, the head of Instagram recently came out and said like, yeah, we're prioritizing photos again, or, or like reels or less of a priority, whatever the heck he said. I knew that like weeks before he said that, just by looking at my analytics and just by seeing, oh wow, my reels aren't performing like they were before. Meanwhile, I posted this random photo of me and that one popped off again, you know? So I think it really is just being hands-on and paying attention to your insights and your analytics. If I ever need confirmation of something, if I'm like, okay, what news came out? You know, verifiable news, or I'm looking for some data on something. I really like the website Social Media Examiner. That's a great one. They post a lot of news. They have podcasts, things like that to talk more in detail. But yeah, I try not to be obsessed with the algorithm because at the end of the day, like the algorithm, wants to show stuff that is exciting, that's interesting to the people who follow us and people who don't follow us. So focus on telling good stories, focus on making good stuff. And in theory, <laughs> the algorithm will do its job. Brittany asked, how to come up with a business name? I'm struggling. Also how to sell your services, 
to potential clients and make them feel confident in hiring you. I have so much content on selling your services. I'm gonna link a couple of resources for you, but how to come up with a business name I don't know. I don't know. It's it's hard. I mean, I think just start by free writing. That's how I came up with my agency name. People ask me all the time, what does James and Park mean? They're like, who's Park? Is that like a business partner? No. Okay. The story of James and Park, James is my last name. I knew that my last name would always be my last name. Like even if I got married, I probably wouldn't change my name. I didn't change my name. But even if I did, like James would always be a meaningful name to me, you know? So I, I knew that that would be something that was forever relevant. And then Park was honestly just a street that I grew up on. And then when I moved to Detroit, my apartment also was like on the intersection of this one street and Park Street. And it just felt like, oh my gosh, I'm coming back. I don't know. I just was like a meaningful, like, okay, cool. And I liked how it sounded. That's how I came up with it. It doesn't mean anything super, uh, super deep, really. I also wanted a name that was semi, I don't want to say androgynous, but like, you know, I didn't necessarily want to just be Latasha James marketing agency, because what if I wanted to sell the agency or what if I did want to hire somebody to replace me as CEO or whatever, I wanted it to kind of be adaptable and flexible and not be so focused on me. So yeah, just do some free writing look and see if there's any words that really stand out to you, pull out a dictionary or a thesaurus. That helps me sometimes too. And um, you just gotta do what feels right. I'll also say, I don't think names matter that much. I really don't. I think if you're creating like a product or an app or a website or something, sure. But agency names, I don't think it matters quite as much. At least it hasn't really for me. Prasita asked, as a new YouTuber, what are the ways to gather more subscribers and views? We can't fight the algorithm, I know. Consistent weekly uploads, yes, I know. What else? How else do I go from five subscribers to 150K? I recently heard releasing daily shorts from your video clips help. Um, okay, I think, I, I don't know about the shorts thing. I've kind of played around with them. My shorts have kind of plateaued for me. They're only getting like a thousand views now, max. In the beginning, they were getting a lot. So I kind of am like, eh, I don't know. I don't think my subscribers really care about shorts. So I have not done a full kind of test with that. Maybe I should do a social media science video on that. Let me know if you're interested. But one thing that I will say, I think few people talk about in, in regards to growing social media in general, whether we're talking about YouTube, Instagram, anything else, is outbound engagement. When I first started my YouTube channel, I was aggressively commenting on people's videos. Not aggressively, like spammy, but I loved YouTube and I still do love YouTube. Like I watch YouTube more than I watch TV. I just love the art of it. I love the creativity of it. I love the people on it. And so I was, I don't comment so much anymore because I watch a lot on my TV now, but in the beginning, I was commenting all the time. Hey, love this video, cute top, whatever. Where'd you get that lipstick? Like, whatever. And I think a lot of people who are becoming content creators don't focus enough on engagement. We focus so much on, we wanna make the best thing ever. We wanna make the best quality video, but that is really only half the battle. You, you also have to expand your network and have conversations with people. So I'm gonna say, if you are posting YouTube videos weekly, you're doing all the things right, um, as this person mentioned, and you're not seeing growth, take a look at how often you're engaging with other videos in your niche. Again, not spamming, but being friendly, just getting your name out there, um, making friends, you know, social media. So I think that's a big, a big thing. Otherwise I did a whole video about growth strategy on YouTube that seemed to help a lot of people. So I will link that for you if you want more on that. Now I'm gonna go over to Instagram because I did get some questions on Instagram as well. I'm sorry, my voice is so raspy. Like, I don't know what's going on. There's also a fruit fly flying around. I keep seeing it. So I'm sorry if you see that guy too. Really love this question. How to deal with mental health and too much screen time as a social media manager. This is something that I certainly struggle with, not just as a social media manager, but also as a creator. I would say more so as a creator than as a social media manager. I think as a social media manager, you're able to say, this is a job. When I'm on the clock, I'm at work. When I'm not on the clock, I'm not. And you can throw your phone out the window if you want to from five to 9 p.m. or whatever. Like you, I think it really is just up to you to really stay true to your workday and your boundaries about when you're on the clock and when you're not. I think that's really like what it comes down to. I also think you can do things like get a second phone. 
That's something that I have done when I was managing a lot of clients. One, because I just needed to, because you know you can only log into a certain number of accounts and stuff on one phone. So I used a different phone when I had like five to seven clients. That helps a lot. I would say as far as like being a creator, I know this isn't really the question, but I'm gonna just go off, I guess. I think that is harder. And, and I think like the entrepreneurship creator side is harder because it becomes ingrained with your being with your person, you know, with your personality, it becomes like meshed in. And sometimes I don't know where internet Latasha and human being Latasha starts and ends. And that can be difficult because if you're anything like me, you got on the internet because you love it. Like I said, I'm obsessed with YouTube. I love watching YouTube. I love making YouTube videos. But when it becomes your job, you know, it's like, I still wanna go on YouTube. I still wanna go on the internet to have fun and to relax, but it's also my job. You know, it's like, it, it, I don't know if it's like, if you worked at like the gym, I could imagine that would be hard because the gym is probably your escape, but then now you work there. So it's like, wait, I don't wanna come to the gym. I don't wanna go to work like to relax. Do you know what I mean? I've met virtually all of my friends on the internet. I'm not joking. I am socially incapable of making real life friends romantic relationships, like everybody I've met on the internet, seriously. Um, and not even like on apps or anything, just like on, like by making friends on Twitter, on Instagram, things like that. And so it is, it's really hard for me to be like, wait, am I talking to people for fun? Am I talking to people to for work? That part I haven't figured out yet outside of like using different platforms for different things, setting boundaries with that, using lists. Like I use my close friends list on Instagram for basically anyone that I've ever talked to in real life. It's not just close friends, but like, okay, I can be myself. I can post music I'm listening to, food I'm making, just silly things. I don't need to always be so focused on posting value. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard. I don't know. I don't I don't know the answer to be honest. <laughs> what advice do you have for people who are having a hard time finding clients right now? So my advice to people who are having a hard time finding clients right now is to just keep moving. When I first started my business, I just made sure that my calendar was always booked with stuff. And I wasn't even like, in the beginning, I wasn't even focused on, is this stuff that's gonna make me money directly? It was just, I need to be talking to people every day. Like if I am just sitting in my office or at my desk or whatever, just sitting and thinking, that's not the that's not the stage of business or life that I'm in right now. I need to be in go mode. I need to be in introduction mode. I need to be in getting clients mode. And so that for me, that meant making sure that I was booking discovery calls every week, ideally like every day. That meant that I was applying for things on job boards, on LinkedIn, you know, posting content, things like that. That meant that I was saying yes to speaking opportunities, volunteer opportunities that could get me in front of the right audience, that I was reaching out to friends and former colleagues who you know, knew what I was doing and wanted to help me. Like I just made sure that I always had a meeting on the calendar. Webinars, hosting events, things like that. I just made sure that I always had stuff on the calendar. If you do that, if you genuinely make sure that you are just booked and busy, it will happen, I'm serious. It will happen eventually. One of those people that you're talking to is gonna have a friend, is gonna have a colleague, is gonna have a new project. They're gonna recommend you to something, they're gonna need something. As long as you keep moving forward, keep moving, you will get clients. Just don't stay stagnant, that's my best advice. Last question I think I'm gonna answer is tips for content for brick and mortar. We do not sell online, so my goal is just to get people in the door. I would say something that I would really focus on is your local area. So what's going on in your general geographic location? Is there, you know, I'm just saying if you're in downtown Detroit and there's a Tigers game going on, make sure to look at the location tag of Tiger Stadium or whatever the heck it's called. I don't even know what it's called anymore. You know, look at those location tags see who's who's attending those events and engage with them. You could even offer some kind of incentive for people who are, you know, coming from that event. Um, hey, get a dollar off your tab if you come and show your Tigers ticket or like whatever that might be, I'm making things up here off the top of my head. But kind of piggybacking off of other big events or other big draws to your area. Also just any other businesses that do really well. So if there is, if you're a boutique, let's say, and there's a really popular restaurant down the street, 
go to their Instagram, look at who is following them, look at who is tagging them, and engage with those people, assuming they're within the same kind of client profile, customer profile that you would want coming to your store. If it's a cool trendy bar and you sell cool trendy clothes, that's a perfect fit. Look at who is following and who's engaging and start following and engaging with them. That's how I found out about all of my favorite local boutiques, honestly. Another thing that definitely gets me in the door is sales sample sales in particular. Obviously that's, I don't know how your markdown schedule works or what exactly you sell. So that might not always be realistic, but if there's just some way to get people in the door, if you can make an event out of it, because the sample sales that I usually go to are also like, I don't drink, but they're like, Hey, you get free white claws if you come or where you get a free gift with purchase, or there's gonna be a live DJ there. So it's an event as well. So think about how you can create events around your place of business as well. Because the thing is, let's be honest, we can get anything that we need on Amazon nowadays. It's just true. I don't love that, but it's just true. So if we're gonna to go to a physical store, there has to be a reason that we are going there. But I think from just a social media aspect, just engage with people locally. Again, outbound engagement is so valuable. So don't forget to do that. All right, I think that is it for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you so much to everybody who submitted questions. Please, if you're watching, if you're a regular viewer, let me know in the comments what videos you wanna see from me, what topics, what platforms you're interested, what problems you're struggling with in your business or whatever, like just tell me anything that you care to tell me. It would be really helpful for me as I'm planning the rest of my content calendar for the summer and spring. And thank you. Thanks for being here. Please subscribe if you happen to be new and enjoy the content. You can leave a thumbs up as well. That really helps me as well. And I will talk to you in my next video very soon. Bye.